Chapter 46 of The Adventures of Peregrine Pickle, Volume 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen The Adventures of Peregrine Pickle, Volume 1 By Tobias Smollett Chapter 46 by the fidelity of Pipes, Jolter is informed of his pupil's fate, confers with the physician, applies to the ambassador, who with great difficulty obtains the discharge of the prisoners on certain conditions. This plan he executed, notwithstanding the pain of his wound, and the questions of the city guard, both horse and foot, to which he could make no other answer than Anglais, Anglais and as soon as it was light, taking an accurate survey of the castle, for such it seemed to be, into which Peregrine and Pallet had been conveyed, together with its situation in respect to the river, he went home to the lodgings, and waking Mr. Jolter gave him an account of the adventure. The governor wrung his hands in the utmost grief and consternation when he heard this unfortunate piece of news. He did not doubt that his pupil was imprisoned in the Bastille for life, and in the anguish of his apprehension cursed the day on which he had undertaken to superintend the conduct of such an imprudent young man, who had by reiterated insults provoked the vengeance of such a mild, forbearing administration. That he might not, however, neglect any means in his power to extricate him from his present misfortune, he dispatched Thomas to the doctor, with an account of his companion's fate, that they might join their interest in behalf of the captives, and the physician, being informed of what had happened, immediately dressed himself and repaired to Jolter, whom he accosted in these words. Now, sir, I hope you are convinced of your error in asserting that oppression can never be the effect of an arbitrary power. Such a calamity as this could never have happened under the Athenian democracy. Nay, even when the tyrant Pisistratus got possession of that commonwealth, he durst not venture to rule with such absolute and unjust dominion. You shall see now that Mr. Pickle and my friend Pallet will fall a sacrifice to the tyranny of lawless power, and in my opinion we shall be accessory to the ruin of this poor enslaved people if we bestir ourselves in demanding or imploring the release of our unhappy countrymen, as we may thereby prevent the commission of a flagrant crime which would fill up the vengeance of heaven against the perpetrators, and perhaps be the means of restoring the whole nation to the unspeakable fruition of freedom. For my own part, I should rejoice to see the blood of my father spilt in such a glorious cause, provided such a victim would furnish me with the opportunity of dissolving the chains of slavery, and vindicating that liberty which is the birthright of man. Then would my name be immortalized among the patriot heroes of antiquity, and my memory, like that of Harmodius and Aristogiton, be honoured by statues erected at the public expense. This rhapsody, which was delivered with great emphasis and agitation, gave so much offence to Jolter, that without saying one word, he retired in great wrath to his own chamber, and the Republican returned to his lodging, in full hope of his prognostic being verified in the death and destruction of Peregrine and the painter, which must give rise to some renowned revolution, wherein he himself would act a principal part. But the governor, whose imagination was not quite so warm and prolific, went directly to the ambassador, whom he informed of his pupil's situation, and besought to interpose with the French ministry, that he and the other British subject might obtain their liberty. His Excellency asked if Jolter could guess at the cause of his imprisonment, that he might be the better prepared to vindicate or excuse his conduct, but neither he nor Pipes could give the smallest hint of intelligence on that subject though he furnished himself from Tom's own mouth with a circumstantial account of the manner in which his master had been arrested, as well as of his own behaviour, and the disaster he had received on that occasion. 
his lordship never doubted that pickle had brought this calamity upon himself by some unlucky prank he had played at the masquerade when he understood that the young gentleman had drunk freely in the afternoon and had been so whimsical as to go thither with a man in woman's apparel and he that same day waited on the french minister in full confidence of obtaining his discharge but met with more difficulty than he expected the court of france being extremely punctilious in everything that concerns a prince of the blood the ambassador was therefore obliged to talk in very high terms and though the present circumstances of the french politics would not allow them to fall out with the british administration for trifles all the favour he could procure was to promise that pickle should be set at liberty provided he would ask pardon of the prince to whom he had given offence his excellency thought this was but a reasonable condescension supposing peregrine to have been in the wrong and jolter was admitted to him in order to communicate and reinforce his lordship's advice which was that he comply with the terms proposed the governor who did not enter this gloomy fortress without fear and trembling found his pupil in a dismal apartment void of all furniture but a stool and a truckle-bed the moment he was admitted he perceived the youth whistling with great unconcern and working with his pencil at the bare wall on which he had delineated a ludicrous figure labelled with the name of the nobleman whom he had affronted and an english mastiff with his leg lifted up in the attitude of making water in his shoe he had been even so presumptuous as to explain the device with satirical inscriptions in the french language which when jolter perused his hair stood on end with affright the very turnkey was confounded and overawed by the boldness of his behaviour which he had never seen matched by any inhabitant of that place and actually joined his friend in persuading him to submit to the easy demand of the minister but our hero far from embracing the counsel of this advocate handed him to the door with great ceremony and dismissed him with a kick on the breeches and to all the supplications and even tears of jolter made no other reply than that he would stoop to no condescension because he had committed no crime but would leave his case to the cognizance and exertion of the british court whose duty it was to see justice done to its own subjects he desired however that pallet who was confined in another place might avail himself of his own disposition which was sufficiently pliable but when the governor desired to see his fellow prisoner the turnkey gave him to understand that he had received no orders relating to the lady and therefore could not admit him into her apartment though he was complacent enough to tell him that she seemed very much mortified at her confinement and at certain times behaved as if her brain was not a little disordered jolter thus baffled in all his endeavours quitted the bastille with a heavy heart and reported his fruitless negotiation to the ambassador who could not help breaking forth into some acrimonious expressions against the obstinacy and insolence of the young man who he said deserved to suffer for his folly nevertheless he did not desist from his representations to the french ministry which he found so unyielding that he was obliged to threaten in plain terms to make it a national concern and not only wrote to his court for instructions but even advised the council to make reprisals and send some french gentleman in london to the tower this intimation had an effect upon the ministry at versailles who rather than run the risk of incensing a people whom it was neither their interest nor inclination to disoblige consented to discharge the offenders on condition that they should leave paris in three days after their enlargement this proposal was readily agreed to by peregrine who was now a little more tractable and heartily tired of being cooped up in such an uncomfortable abode for the space of three long days without any sort of communication or entertainment but that which his own imagination suggested end of chapter forty six recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey